yeah before we start please confirm the streaming uh, and also the audio quality one two three is it clear or do you want me to raise my voice So it's a new setting for me. So let's, let's go ahead. Oh, very good evening, everyone. So welcome to our first dinner session of this week. So in today's dinner session, we'll have some MCQs practice in cumulative manner based on various key points or key topics from different subjects. So in a previous uh, week's discussions, we covered several clinical subjects. So we'll try to extend that discussion and we'll try to cover even more clinical subjects coupled with basic subjects. So I hope you guys are all ready. So before we start, I have uh, uh, the following information for you. See, uh, I've been getting mails of late very frequently as exam date is approaching regarding various uh, stresses that one is facing during uh, their normal course of life. So it can be responsibilities, it can be uh, health related issues, because of COVID pandemic, it can be any other reason. I know things can be very stressful. Situations can be very stressful. Usually in such scenarios, we tend to give up because we're afraid, uh, because we think we're not capable of dealing with these challenges. And uh, we feel very demotivated. That's understandable. But before you judge the given scenario or situation, before you decide that you're not fit to uh, face that challenge or overcome the challenge. I suggest you to just hold on, give it a thought and follow this very simple strategy. See, you have so many, uh, we all have so many issues, so many priorities, so many responsibilities. It can be work related, it can be family related, it can be health related, what not. We can just go on and on. No matter what uh, the priorities or challenges are, just keep this in mind that taking one step at a time, Taking one step at a time will help you overcome any kind of challenge and also helps you accomplish all your priorities. For suppose right now, you have two or three priorities like taking care of family, uh, cooking dinner or having dinner, watching your favorite show, attending this live session. So you have your own priorities, customized priorities. Just make sure that you're arranging them in an order based on your uh, requirements or based on your uh, priorities like for suppose uh, at this point of time live session mcks discussion should be your topmost priority given the fact that you're all preparing for the upcoming entrance so likewise having dinner likewise taking care of other things so you can list out various priorities and rank them from one to five at any given point of time we have several priorities uh, in our mind so rank them from one to five and start with the first one, try to complete or accomplish it. This technique or this simple task of taking one step at a time or dealing a one priority at a time will enable you overcome any kind of challenge at any given point of time. Take my word. So uh, this is, uh, I wanted to start with this because even today I got several mails where students have been mentioning about various challenges they have been facing during Christmas. So, challenges are, see, uh, in any life form, we do have challenges. So, we all have our own customized challenges. It's not about escaping from these challenges, but it's about overcoming these challenges, facing and overcoming them so that we see a better version of ourselves. So, that should be uh, in everyone's mind. So, no matter what the priorities or challenges you have, rank them and deal with them one by one, right? One step at a time one challenge at a time, one priority at a time. It's going to do, uh, uh, if not magic, it's going to do wonders. Take my word, right? So with these introductory comments, let's go ahead with our MCQs discussion. I hope you guys are all ready. And before we start, again, uh, for these uh, sessions, I, as I mentioned previously, I wanted to keep three factors in mind. 
first and foremost, whatever topic or question or point you come across, consider that it's going to be repeated in final exam. This gives you a sense of seriousness. You will not take things for granted. And second, make notes simultaneously for all these live sessions, exclusively for these live sessions. It can be key points, keywords, it doesn't matter. Have your own customized notes. And number three, enjoy the process because that's what ultimately matters. So be aware of the moment, just participate actively and most importantly, enjoy what you're doing. And in fact, learning is an enjoyable process. And if you look into the title of this video, as rightly said, learning is fun. It's always fun if you're doing it in a right way. So with these uh, objectives in mind, I mean, keep these aspects in mind whenever you attend any live session or any class for that matter. And let's go ahead. And those who are planning for an ECMDS 2022, that is the upcoming entrant, you can check out details of our crash course. And also uh, for 2023, as friends, we have a regular batch, which we launched this October. You can get back through May, or you can check our website, ptvdacademy.com for all the details, right? So with these introductory comments, and before we jump into our first multiple choice question, 5 a.m. club. So as you know, we already initiated our 5 a.m. club sessions. We restarted them, and today we had our first 5 a.m. club. So initially, it might be a struggle, but once you get habituated waking up early in the morning, you'll be having an additional three to four hours of quality time, not per week, not per month, not per year, but per day. This is the kind of difference it's going to make at the end of the week. Uh, six days, six days, 18, you'll, you're going to get an additional day, 18 to 24 hours in a given week's span compared to those who sleep late and wake up late, right? So early bird rises, uh, this is, I, I would definitely recommend you all to wake up early in the morning. If it's not your domain, you can make it a habit, even now, right? It takes at least 21 days to condition yourself, uh, to habituate yourself to a new habit. Keep trying, because as I mentioned previously in the morning session as well, waking up early gives you additional quality hours it's a time where you have least distractions and your concentration potential is at its peak. So you can utilize those quality hours towards your priorities. Again, I'm not just talking about preparation. If preparation is your number one priority, then that time goes to that, uh, obviously for preparation. But you have other things to take care of. Of course, you can take care of and you'll have your entire day for yourself. Right. So without much delay, let's go ahead with our first question. Yes. So first and foremost, I hope you can see the screen clearly. And if it is not visible, don't worry, I'm going to read it for you. Uh, before uh, this live session, I had a mock run and the screen was pretty visible. In fact, I've adjusted the brightness accordingly. So if you have any issues, do let me know. So first question. So again, uh, we have five questions, maximum of 20 marks at the end of the session. You can let me know your score for review, right? So consider this as a mini challenge. Composite resin tags may penetrate up to dash microns into enamel to give micro mechanical retention. So what's the depth of penetration of composite resin tags into enamel? Is it one micron? Is it five microns? Is it 50 microns or is it 500 microns? Which one do you think is more appropriate answer? See, there are various standard references quoting different values. Philip says one standard reference article say other value because as per studies, depending upon the technique involved in that study, depending upon the author's perspective and also observational skills, the values tend to change. But keeping the inference in mind, we'll uh, follow certain standard textbooks and we'll rely upon the information given over there. So composite resin tags may penetrate up to what depth into enamel to give micro mechanical retention. You know, bonding concept is so beautiful. Nakabayashi and others have come up with these concepts. Uh, people from Japan, they consider to be pioneers, especially in this uh, field of uh, bonding, dentin bonding, enamel bonding, hybrid layer technology, etc. So the concept is very simple. You have a surface enamel or dentin. Uh, let's talk about enamel since the context here is enamel. You're trying to create micro porosity and then you're trying to penetrate or, uh, you know, uh, apply a resin so that the resin flows into this micro porosity, creating this micro mechanical bonding. 
So it's not just, unlike amalgam, it's not just mechanical, it is micro-mechanical because at a microscopic level you have this bonding, since it's called micro-mechanical bonding. And then you have another type of bonding that is chemical bonding. So uh, to have an overview of different types of bonding, we have mechanical and chemical. In mechanical, again, we have this micro-mechanical. So this is possible because of the fact that we're able to create micro porosities in a given surface using an acid. Phosphoric acid, as you know, 30 to 50 percent buffered phosphoric acid create these micro porosities or etching, we call it in simple terms. And then we're trying to enhance the bonding by allowing these resin tags to penetrate into these artificially created micro porosities. So which one do you think is a more appropriate answer? Yes, as majority of you have rightly mentioned, it is, yeah, option C is right answer, 50 microns. So you can award yourself plus four. Now let's uh, review some literature regarding the same, and uh, uh, this is where you can enter those relevant points in your customized notes. So first and foremost, success of this bonding depends upon adequate moisture control. So rubber dam isolation is not a, a choice, it is mandatory, right? When you're going ahead with adhesive procedures. So moisture control is very important because any contact with saliva for as little as 0.5 seconds will contaminate the etching pattern. And then you have to go for re-etching. So, uh, uh, so what about prophylaxis? Should you go for scaling and all? Usually not necessary, but there is, if there is visible plug, abundant plug, then you have to go for prophylaxis. So prophylaxis prior to etching is not required unless abundant plug deposits are present. And as you know, 30 to 50% of buffered phosphoric acid provides the best enamel edge pattern. And an etching time of 15 to 20 seconds is uh, suggested, even though this time increases with uh, fluorosed enamel as well as with primary T. And edge pattern is easily damaged using either a probe, which you try to uh, use uh, to apply the etchant in pits and fissures, or you might use a cotton uh, uh, pellet. So this might, in fact, damage the edge pattern. So you should not use this uh, hard surfaces. And there is no difference. See, uh, uh, when coming to bond strength, we have different types of uh, this etchant that is available in terms of consistency. You have etchant in the form of solution. You have etchant in the form of gel. So when compared to this solution form of etchant and gel form of etchant, do you think there is any bond strength difference? As you know, uh, with, uh, with gel form uh, consistency, you have better control of uh, the material, better control, or the flow of the material over the tooth surface can be controlled. And also you'll have better contrast compared to liquid etchant. So what about bond strength difference? You have liquid etchant and gel etchant. So among these two, which one do you think has a better bond strength? So try to find out, it's a very interesting thing. And uh, let me know in uh, tomorrow's live session or feel free to get back through mail for discussion on the same. Difference in bond strength when you use liquid etchant versus gel etchant, right? And also, I'm sure you might have seen both in your clinical practice. What about rinsing? So after etching, you go for rinsing, as you know, for a duration of approximately 15 seconds. And remineralization of etched enamel occurs from the saliva. And after 24 hours, it is indistinguishable from untreated enamel. So it takes around 24 hours to completely remineralize. And etched enamel is porous and has a high surface energy. And as you can see, we have these resin tags penetrating into intact enamel, right? So that's the concept we're talking about. The edge pattern of enamel consists of three zones from the surface into the deeper aspect. Consider this very, very important. The three zones include the first one that is etched zone, right? Which has a, a length or depth of 10 microns where the enamel is completely remote. That is etched zone followed by qualitative zone of 20 microns and quantitative zone or quantitative porous zone of 20 microns. So a total of 50 microns, 10 plus 20 plus 20. So uh, there are, uh, they have categorized the etched surface into three zones, right? So etched zone, qualitative and quantitative. So composite resin tags, as majority of you rightly said, can penetrate approximately up to 50 microns into enamel. We're not talking about dentin again. We're talking about enamel in specific to give this micro-mechanical retention, right? I hope it's clear. And if you need any further clarification, feel free to get back to me 24 by 7, right? So as majority of you rightly said, 
option C is right answer. Well done. Now let's move on to the next question. I hope you made a note of a certain key points which we tried to highlight in the process. Now let's move on to the next question. Identify the shapes of bus. You don't have any options. All you have is illustrations. So observe them and identify as many as possible. So you have around 12 shapes of dental bus. So starting from one, yeah, you can go zigzag pattern clockwise or based on a convenience. I've numbered it so that it will be easy for you to identify. So identify the shapes of dental bus. As you know, dental bus, these are commonly used in our clinical practice for preparing tooth, preparing cavities, removing caries, uh, 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 you know, cutting enamel, dentin. So there are so many uh, uses of these dental births and the materials which are used for making these dental births are either carbide, tungsten carbide, as you know, uh, diamond points, or even stainless steel for that matter. So different materials can be used and also the head attachments are different. We have friction grip, latch type and so on. So observe these shapes and try to identify as many shapes as possible. The first one I'm sure is pretty easy. Please don't say you can't see the illustration. Can't you? I think the illustration is pretty clear, right? So the first, yeah, I think it's pretty clear. But let's see. Yeah, so basic shapes, you know, round, tapered, straight, uh, cylindrical, wheel shaped. So I've given you the answers. Uh, it's all about identifying now. So identify as many as possible. In the meantime, let me review some uh, literature. So as I said, dental burr, uh, the head, uh, burr head, uh, materials, we have different types of materials like uh, steel, stainless steel, tungsten carbide or diamond. So diamond, we call it as diamond points. A birth, usually a uh, tungsten carbide birth. So the nomenclature slightly varies. And also, uh, as I said, shape and function for excavation of caries. You know, we even have smart births. Uh, if you remember, smart births, there were several questions on the same previously also. Smart births made of polymeric materials and single time use, used for removing infected dentin, if you remember. So also we have birth made of polymeric materials. That's my point. And depending upon the head attachments, you have latch grip, friction grip, etc. So friction grip you might have used. Here rotors, latch grip, you have these micro motors. So we have so many configurations available. And to a common man, it all seems Greek and Latin. But dentistry, right from first year BDS itself, we're all used to these terminologies, isn't it? Yeah, so identify as many as possible. Okay, those who answer at least one among 12 will be awarded plus four. You need not answer all 12 to get plus four. Even if you get a one option right, you'll be awarded plus four. So that's a bonus I can give you. Okay, okay, very good. So keep answering. So the first one, as you can see, it is rose head or a round shape. Second one, flame shaped. Third one, it's a wheel. Wheel shaped, occlusal reduction. Fourth one, American football, football shaped. Fifth one, it is tapered. Yeah, tapered with chamfer end. Yeah, and sixth one is tapered fissure. The seventh one is flattened taper. Eighth one, it is cylindrical. Ninth one, cylindrical with beveled ends. Uh, tenth one, straight. Uh, yeah, it's a pear shaped bur. Two, four, five, if you remember the dimensions as well. So, tenth one is pear shaped. I, I, I'm sure it's not that clear, but don't worry. You know the shape, right? And eleventh one is striped fissure. And twelfth one is inverted cone which we're not supposed to use. Uh, during undergraduation, first year, second year, maybe we used it, but it's not required. Straight feature, oriented or angulated, 
to create those on records for amalgam preparation. Very good. So those who have answered at least one of them correctly, please award yourself plus four. If you haven't answered anything, then zero marks. Okay, now let's move on to, before that, we have the key. I don't think uh, it's visible, but yeah, as I said, round rose head, the first one, second one is flame, third one is wheel, fourth one football, fifth one taper with chamfer, and sixth one is taper, seventh one flattened taper, eighth one cylinder, ninth one cylinder with bevel. Yeah, the tenth one is pear shaped, eleventh one is uh, straight, a straight fissure. Flat fissure, 12th one is inverted cone, right? You know this uh, burr shape. And also the sizes of the burr. In fact, in round burr itself, we have different sizes, which will uh, get back in a form of multiple choice question in a different session. Okay? So here is the sequence and the corresponding uh, names of the burr based on the burr head shape. Right? Very good. Now let's move on to the next question. Third question. Treatment without consent. What is it? Negligence, assault, battery, none of the above. So which one do you think is more appropriate answer? Treatment without consent. First of all, what is consent? See, permission. Can we consider permission as consent? Yes. So before you start or initiate any treatment to the patient, as a clinician, uh, we should be able to explain the procedure, like why we are doing it, what's the procedure, uh, and how we do it, and the complications, if any. Along with that, the risk assessment, prognosis, and any other alternative treatments that are available in that particular clinical situation, right? So you need to clearly explain, and the staff in your clinic should be equipped to be able to obtain a consent before proceeding with treatment. If not, that's the question. Treatment without consent is, is it negligence? Is it assault? Is it battery? Or is it none of the above? Which one do you think is more appropriate answer? Okay, very good, well tried. So let's review some literature and before we proceed, let me give you the key or I'll give you the key after we have this discussion. Okay, so first and foremost, treatment without consent is considered assault or battery. Yeah, but treatment, you give a general consent but you do not mention about complications or other specifics that it falls under negligence. So consent is voluntary and continuous permission of a competent patient. The patient should be competent in a or else uh, those who attend the patient. We should obtain consent from them if the patient is not fit, right, uh, to give the consent. So consent is a voluntary and continuous permission of a competent patient to receive a particular treatment based on patient being informed regarding the purpose nature and likely risks of treatment, including the likelihood of its success and any other alternatives. Permission given under any unfair or undue pressure is not consent. It doesn't hold uh, in, uh, in the court. Treatment without consent is called assault or battery. So both options B and C are right answer. This is a multiple right answer question. Okay. So you don't give consent and you treat it falls under assault or it falls under battery touching or injuring or intention to injure without taking permission uh, or trying to treat without taking permission treatment without any consent is considered as assault or battery treatment with general consent but without explanation is considered as negligence right so consent shall be and should be obtained by clinician in immediate charge of the patient and everyone in the uh, hospital, right, should be uh, equipped with uh, taking a consent. They should know how to take consent and the importance of it. And most importantly, consent can be given in writing, verbally, or it can be even implied. 
So writing or verbal, it's understood. Then what is implied consent? If I say I want treatment, uh, I understand the risks, I want the treatment uh, to be done. That is verbal consent. Or if the same is there on paper and I sign it, that is, yeah, a writing, consent through writing. Why writing? Then what is implied consent? Implied consent means you don't express it through words. That is, there is no explicit way of uh, saying yes, but there is implicit way of saying yes. For suppose, you want to get a vaccination, you take your other, you feed your details, and then you take an appointment, pay the money, or give other details in that particular PHC or in the hospital where they're giving you COVID vaccination, and then you roll up the sleeve, and then you take the flu shot. Nowhere in the process you have said, or no one has taken consent, or you have said, uh, I want to take vaccination. No, you've just done all these steps. So it is implied, right? So that's what implied consent means. I hope you got my point. So implied consent means the patient's actions reflect the patient's consent to treatment or procedures. It's understood through their implicit actions, even though there is no external words or explicit words uh, that were uttered by the patient. Okay, so B and C, those have chosen either B or C, award yourself plus four marks, right? I hope it's clear. Yeah, now let's move on to the penultimate question. So, anatomy, physiology based, let's see how many of you are going to get it right. If a patient's SA and AV node, sinoatrial, auriculoventricular nodes fail, what is the most likely situation the patient will be in? Option A, the patient's heart will fail immediately. Option B, the ventricles will contract and passively fill, keeping the patient alive for a shorter period. Option C, the atria will take over and contract. Option D, both atria and ventricles will continue to contract on a pace of a bundle of hills. So which one do you think is more appropriate answer? I know it's a challenging question, but I'm sure you can answer it, right? And before we go ahead with explanation or key, Let's look into the basic structure of heart. So in terms of the conduction system, right? Not the anatomical structure. So as you can see, we have SA node, which is considered as pacemaker, you know, right? And then you have this, yeah, AV node. And then you have from AV node, we have this bundle of his. And bundle of his gives bundle branches, trifascicular system. And from there, you have this finite, uh, uh, fine, thread-like structures called Purkinje fibers, which are spreading into ventricles. So the objective here is to make sure that whatever SA node is generating the impulse that is being transmitted throughout the heart. So as you can see, uh, this bundle of his, right, this is originating from AV node. So this bundle of his is present on interventricular septum as clearly evident. If in case the pacemaker fails, the AV node along with bundle of his called AV junctional tissue, it has intrinsic pacemaker activity, which beats at a pace of 40 to 60 beats per minute, right? If in case SA node fails, so we have this AV junctional tissue, which takes matters into its hands and controls the heart rate and rhythm. If suppose SA node and AV node fail, then you have this ventricular conduction system, which is formed by the bundle of his, the branches of bundle of his and Purkinje fibers, which take matter into their hands and then control the heart rate and rhythm. And this ventricular conducting uh, conduction system, right, VCS, has intrinsic pacemaker activity and beats at a pace of around 30 to 40 beats per minute. This is very, very important. So if in case SA node fails, we have AV junctional tissue to take care of the heart rate and rhythm. If both SA and AV node fail, we have this ventricular conduction system, which takes care of heart rate and rhythm. So you have numerous uh, fail-safe mechanisms to make sure that the heart is beating and the person is surviving. Now, coming to bundle of his, the interesting thing here is, as I said, bundle of his originates from AV node. As you can see, it's there on interventricular septum. And from bundle of his, you have bundle branches. So there are three branches which are called as trifascicular system. These include right branch, 
left anterior superior and left posterior inferior. You might have heard of these names and these three constitute the trifascular system. And along with that, you have these finite elements or fibers called Purkinje fibers, which, dis which are distributed all over the ventricle walls to conduct the impulse, which is generated in SNO. So this bundle of his, the trifascular system and Purkinje fibers constitute ventricular conduction system, which takes matters into its hand. That is the control, the heart rate and rhythm in case SA and AV node fails. So this is the backdrop of this particular question. Now let's look into the question once again and you tell me what the right answer is. So if a patient's SA and AV nodes fail, what is the most likely situation the patient will be in? Option A, the patient's heart will fail immediately and the patient is dead. Option B, the ventricles will contract and passive will fail, keeping the patient alive for a short period. Option C, the atria will take over and contract. Or option D, both uh, atria and ventricles will continue to contract on the pace of bundle of his, that is 30 to 40 beats per um, minute. That is ventricular conduction system. So which one do you think is a more appropriate answer? Excellent. So as majority of you rightly said, option D is the right answer. Well done. Keep it up. Award yourself plus four. And before we proceed, uh, Hitesh says volume is low. Uh, can anyone else uh, give the feedback? Because I'm using these earphones specifically to make sure that the audio output is good. Or else we can do with an open mic system, but compared to open mic, having these headphones or earphones enhances the audio output. So any one of you can uh, give me your feedback so that we can adjust the audio accordingly. Okay. So for now, Hitesh, I'll try to raise my voice. Okay. Don't worry. And if possible, try to use earphones for enhanced audio output. Now coming to final question. So case-based question, which I am sure you'll rock. On a cricket ground during break, to end of minutes, what do you call the to end of minute break in T20? Power nap? No. Oh, what is it called? Power play? No, it's not power play. I mean, the umpire signal uh, with, uh, like this, uh, show, showing his watch. Yeah, strategic timeout. Yeah, my mind is working. Thank God. So, during strategic timeout, Shubham was playing cricket. There was strategic timeout on the ground and there was an accident. So, on a cricket ground during a strategic timeout, in fact, when I say strategic timeout, it's a funny thing. Yes, because you know what? Uh, more than cricket match, we often see the ads. I mean, the amount of ads we see nowadays is far dominating the actual uh, play, which is very funny. So on a cricket ground during break, Shubham is strung by a bee, honeybee. Immediately, he breaks out in hives, as you can see. So there is articaria and starts gasping for air. The coach grabs epinephrine. Ravi Shastri. Okay, and uh, he grabs epinephrine shot from the first aid kit and saves him. What cells are responsible for this reaction? I'm not talking about antibodies, but what cells are responsible for this reaction? Kupfer cells, macrophages, platelets, mast cells. So which one do you think is more appropriate answer? As you know, we have certain cells in our uh, blood, uh, in our body's connective tissue. So these are metachromatic granules within them. And upon stimulation, that is antibody antigen reaction, these cells release large amounts of histamine, heparin, bradykinin, serotonin, slow releasing substance of anaphylaxis, chemotactic factors, and lysosomal enzymes, what not. So what cell am I talking about? And these mediators which are released in large quantities during this antigen antibody triggering reaction are responsible for various kinds of vascular changes and events that ensure after uh, that that are actually responsible for these kind of uh, clinical manifestations. In fact, this is something which I usually mention at least once a year for all the students. So during my uh, second BDS, I had a cauliflower pickle, pickle made of cauliflower uh, last night and then I went to college and uh, it was a delayed kind of reaction. I don't know what happened. Suddenly, I started developing hives. Urticaria, generalized urticaria. I still remember the diagnosis. Uh, my friends were worried. They took me to one of our professors in dental college. We have no medical college attached. So 
So we went to one of our departments, uh, to our favorite professor, and he immediately gave a will, antihistamine, and to which the hives did not subside. And then he immediately suggested us to a dermatologist, or other professor's uh, sister, and uh, I was taken away immediately, and I was uh, given IV steroid. I don't remember exactly the dosage, but the steroid was given. And you know, miraculously and instantaneously, the symptoms subsided. I didn't have difficulty in breathing, but I had generalized urticaria. Maybe I was feeling some uh, discomfort. So steroids did the magic. So this is one of the experiences which I always remember. And I was told by uh, that dear dermatologist that uh, please don't take that cauliflower pickle. So after a couple of months or a couple of years, I don't remember exactly, but I tried again, but I didn't have that uh, experience that bad experience again. Maybe one of the ingredients in that pickle might have led to this uh, generalized urticaria or a hive. But other than that, it was all fine. So luckily now I can enjoy cauliflower pickle, even though I didn't eat it for the past several years due to non-availability. So the point here is, which cells are responsible for all this story? So as majority of you rightly mentioned, it's your IgE antibody remediated anaphylaxis reaction which have propensity to bind with mast cells. So upon exposure to uh, antigen, again, so antigen antibody reaction triggers release of these mediators, as I mentioned previously, histamine, heparin, serotonin, radicanin, slow releasing substance of anaphylaxis, lysosomal enzymes, eosinophil chemotactic factors, neutrophil chemotactic factors, all of them are released into bloodstream with an intention to drive away this foreign body. That's the intention there, right? Inflammation, localized response of a vascularized living tissue, right, to ward off infection and to throw it out from uh, from your own house because it's an invader. So, as you all rightly said, mast cells is more appropriate. Mast cells and basophils, mast cells is the right answer. Well done, everyone. Keep it up. So, it is Ig mediated anaphylaxis. I hope it's clear. So present your scores now. So out of 20, maximum of five posts, 20 marks, how much did you guys score? So present your scores, I would allow to have a review. And before we go ahead, yes, very good Danish, mast cell activation type and hypersensitivity. Yes, uh, Danish, it's a very good question. SA node fails to generate action potential, shouldn't heart uh, fail? Please explain, sir. Of course, yes, we think heart fails, but as I said, we have this fail-safe mechanism. We have this backup mechanism. When you lose power in your home, you have your generator, you, are, you have your inverter. In this case, we have two generators. As you have seen, if SA node fails, the AV node takes up matters into its own hands. That is, it has the intrinsic pacemaker activity. Mark my words, intrinsic pacemaker activity. If AV node fails, then we have this ventricular conduction system, which also has this intrinsic pacemaker activity. So heart doesn't fail, person doesn't die. Right? I hope it's clear. Okay, Vista says uh, audio is a bit low, but Vinita says audio is good. Okay, we will see. Thank you for the feedback, guys. So, Danish, I'm suffering from chronic symptomatic urticaria for a decade almost. I need to take antihistamine often. Oh, so sorry to hear that, Danish. Yeah, in fact, even uh, my wife, Soumya, has uh, this problem with prawns. So she never uh, eats prawns. Fresh prawns are fine, but the stored prawn, I don't know what ingredient it is. We'd love to know. It causes urticaria. Hives, generalized hives within a matter of uh, minutes. Yeah. And I'm really sorry to hear that. And anyways, try to identify the causative factor so that uh, you can uh, save yourself at least when you're going out of station or farther from the hospital. Yes, very good. 15, 20 on 20. So I think some of you have secured 20 on 20. 16, 15. Excellent. Dipanjan, Ritu, Maheshwari. Surendra, Smriti, Pallavi. Yes. Danish. 
Okay, guys. So these are some of the topics which I wanted to highlight. And as I said, as we initiated this discussion, so we all have our own set of challenges. Uh, just make sure that you're dealing uh, or taking one step at a time, uh, managing one priority at a time. It gives you the peace of mind, gives you ample clarity, and enables you to focus on the task at hand. And no matter how challenging the situations are, no matter how tough you feel that the current situation is, and it, it comes to anything. It can be preparation, it can be health issues, it can be family issues, personal issues, it can be anything. Just believe in yourself. Allow yourself sometimes. And always keep these three factors in mind. Hard work, consistency, and self-belief. Always keep these three factors in mind and enjoy what you're doing. And for any further queries or assistance, feel free to get back through mail 24 by 7. In fact, last week's study club assignment, I've asked some of you. I think I posted this question in study club, asking you about your plan of action for revision for 2022 aspirants and for 2023. What are the factors you should keep in mind uh, as you have one year towards preparation? So those who haven't answered that those questions yet, do get back through mail as soon as possible. We'll uh, consider making videos along those lines and we'll get back to you as soon as possible, right? So for any further queries or assistance or guidance, feel free to get back through mail 24 by 7, right? So I'll see you tomorrow morning in 5 a.m. club. Don't miss it out. Attend, consider this a mandatory because uh, once initially it might be a force, but once you're used to waking up early in the morning, it's going to be amazing. Mark my word. I'll see you tomorrow morning at 5 o'clock. In 5 a.m. club, we'll have general discussion and then we'll go ahead with our dinner sessions at 9 p.m. as usual. I hope it's clear. Wish you all the best. Love you all. Good night. Oh, Maheshwari, even your sister has urticaria with prawns and crabs. Oh, same page. Monica, Priyanka, Truth. Yeah. Okay, guys. Good night. Take care.